Hi, my name is Nicole. My name is Shell. My name is Diamond. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the Dope Student Podcast. And who do we have here today? Lauren Gardner from Black. Oh, yeah. Oh. Do I get to say where I'm from? <laughs> yeah. 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 From Black High School Apprenticeship, Bergen Plumbing Heating, from Iowa. That's the big thing. Okay, Mr. Lauren. So today we're going to be asking you some questions. Can you share more about your unique career journey, including the pivotal moments that led you to your current role in the trades? Yeah. So my unique journey, I, I went to college, which now I'm, I'm not anti-college, but I think there's a lot more out there for people to do. So I went to college, I got a teaching degree and then it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried other things. Um, I went into the wholesale, I did some financial, but how I really got into the trades was being a little brother. So my big brother started a company and so I tag along. I went on overtime calls. I learned a lot of the stuff and he started a company then. Um, and over time, his company grew pretty big, and he needed this position that really encompassed all the things that I do. And so he offered me a position to basically do, the position was called other, <laughs> other duties as assigned. So if there's ever anything that needs done at the company, that's what I do. And which really led into uh, starting a trade school. Um, we had, we would have send our people out to get trained um, and it just, we weren't happy with the product we got back. And so we started our own, so it came, we had to dive in and figure out, I mean, from creating the curriculum to creating a name, we're in Blackhawk mm -hmm. County, that's where we came up with uh, the name, but I mean, everything, how we wanted to structure it, that's been, you know, my unique journey, that was the pivotal moment of where my kind of like my mission in life is to bring people into the trades, that mm -hmm. was it, when we decided we got to start a school. Your approach to training apprentices involves a combination of bookwork, hands-on training, and code knowledge. How do you believe this method sets your program apart from others in the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the way we train our apprentices is they, they still have to get the bookwork. But I believe people who are getting into the trades, for the most part, they come to me, they come to our school not liking school, um, but they learn better with their hands. I think everybody does. And so, but you still have to have the book work. You can't get away yeah. from it. And unfortunately you have to know how things work. So we structure our day. We start the day off in the classroom doing the book work. Let's read about how water flows, why you need um, slope, what are thermodynamics, some of the things, the definition, stuff like that. Some of the boring stuff. Mm -hmm. But then we spend our afternoon actually doing it. Whatever we read about in the morning, we're then going to go in the afternoon and we're going to do. If we were, if our, our latest chapter was on fixtures in the plumbing class I just taught last Wednesday. So we read about toilets and sinks and all that stuff. So then we went into our hands-on training room, much like uh, yours guys is here, and they'll set toilets. So they actually get to put them together. And so they get to make their mistakes in the classroom in a safe yeah. space. Um, and then the last part about the code book, when you get into the trades, the code book basically becomes your Bible. I mean, that is... Um, that's where everything goes. And mm -hmm. so we, they have to know how to use their code book. They don't have to memorize it. They just need to know how to find it. So we spend their last year of their apprenticeship really diving deep into the code book so they can answer any question and they know where to find it so that they're doing things the right way. Okay. You mentioned being passionate about bringing people into the trades. Could you elaborate on why you believe this is important and what impact it can have on individuals and the industry as a whole? Man, you guys got some good ones. Um, I, I'm super passionate, you're right, and bringing people in. I see the trades as one way, when we talk about the American dream, you know, for the past 250 years, the trades are a way any person can take themselves from whatever situation they're in, and they can raise themselves to a great lifestyle. The trades are great paying careers. It's a fulfilling life where you're helping people day in and day out, and I love that I could get to go talk. I go all the way down. Last year, I talked to kindergartners, um, all the way to people who have graduated high college and military vets. But they can, I can bring them into the trades where they can have a positive impact on their communities and then help their families. I mean, they can provide. They own homes. They have toys like, you know, snowmobiles and four-wheelers and things like that. And it's just a great life. So when I get to go and bring somebody who I know is in a tough situation, and I can introduce them to the trades and then get them to sign on and go through the steps and just see it through till they have that journey person card in their hand where they are a licensed professional. That just, I mean, it tears me up a little bit. 
Yeah. What specific challenges did you face in creating a school and curriculum for training technicians? How did you overcome these challenges and what was the most rewarding part of the process? Yeah. Um, so, boy, there I am. I hate people to start off the sentence, so, and I just did it. <laughs> um, starting the, the school was a huge challenge. You would think sometimes it's better when you have guidelines, parameters that you have to build around because you know where you have to be. Here, we had a blank slate. And so we got to build it however we wanted to within the, guess, the guidelines of the state of Iowa, of the things, the courses I had to teach. But we knew the way it was being done wasn't up to our standards at a company I was at. And so the product we were getting, they weren't, it wasn't working. So the challenges was trying to inter, intertwine all those things we talked about earlier, the hands-on training, um, the book work, the code work, um, all into one curriculum. Because most of their learning, so they come to school only one day a week. Uh, the rest, the other four days, they're out working in the field with licensed journey persons and masters. And so they're learning mostly from the people in the field. Mm -hmm. I have that one day where I get to mold their minds a little bit. They, the other four days, that's where the art form is had. That's where guys um, and girls teach them how to like, make it an art instead of just doing it. Um, Again, some of the biggest struggles, how to fit it all in, you know, how to, and then just trusting, you know, when you just go out there that first year, is this going to work? Our first class, we started with seven and we had lost one the first year. We lost that second one the last year. So we graduated five. It took, it's a three-year program, um, but just having that faith that it's going to keep working, then going out and recruiting again, and then COVID hit. So I couldn't go to any school, so I couldn't go recruit anybody. So keeping it sustaining, and now actually the struggle is having so many students in the program, the company is trying to find now positions for them <laughs> because the company I'm with, we can only handle so many apprentices. And so that struggle, the new struggle is trying to find places to get all these people that I'm encouraging to get into the trades. In discussing the creation of your school, you mentioned addressing issues such as class schedules and exam difficulties. How do you think these changes have positively impacted the learning experience for your students? Yeah, a lot. First day of class, we talk about, and they're level one, we talk about your main goal is to, uh, you're going to have to pass your journey person exam in three years, which is 75%. And what I get out of almost every student is, well, I'm not good at tests. I'm not good at tests. And I just shoot that down right there. That's like, that, that's not an excuse anymore. You have to take a test. And so we're going to stop saying that. We're going to work to get you better at tests. And so we do spend time over the three years where I throw questions that are harder than the state exam at them just to kind of get in their head um, of, yes, I can get better at this. There's nothing that, mis that, you know, that I haven't thrown at them that will be... Everything they're going to see on the adjournment exam is going to be easier than what I've thrown at them so that they get ready for it. But we base everything. So 75% is what you have to, to pass the journey person exam. So everything in our classroom over those three years is based on 75%. And it is 74.9. You failed, just like the test. When you pass that journey person exam, nobody asks later on, hey, what would you get on your score? No, do you have that card in your pocket? You know, 75.1 is the same as a 98.4 as far as winning that card. Now you have competition in your classes because it becomes a brotherhood, sisterhood in the classroom that, yes, they have competition. What'd you get? <laughs> What'd you, I, I got 90. We, everybody knows what the high score is, even though I've never published it <laughs> because they talk to each other. There's still that competition. So all these students who aren't good test takers, by the time they get through three years, they are ready for the exam. And um, one of the things we pride ourselves on is the, we've only had two students ever not pass their journey person exam on the first try. And the journey person exam is a very hard exam. Um, other companies, uh, it's multiple times. And so we pride ourselves at one and done, and we've got this uh, toilet seat that would put a plaque with their name on it if they pass first try. And so it's filling up pretty quick. I'll have to get a second color toilet seat. It's this, <laughs> it's this ugly golden tan, 1970s yellow. <laughs> but they all want their name on it. Yes. <laughs> As someone deeply involved in recruiting and training, what advice do you have for, stu 
for students considering a career in the trades, especially those who might be hesitant or uninformed about the opportunities available? Do it. Next question. No. Um, <laughs> but no, that, that's, that's the key. Just try it. If you're even thinking about it or you're a little hesitant, you need to try the trades. There is no negative, nothing negative about trying the trades. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you go into a skilled trade, you know, being an electrician, being a plumber, being an HVAC, um, out here, you know, you got a lot more skilled trades. You know, you learn about masonry and construction out here. You try any of those things, you get into them, there's skills that you're going to have for the rest of your life. You get two years into a plumbing program and you decide it's just not for me. I do want to go to college. I do want to do this or that. You don't have, it's not, it's not the same. I, the example I always use. So when I was in college, you have to fill all these boxes. I have to take so many credits here. I have to take so many credits here mm-hmm. of this. And so when I got to my senior year, I'm missing one in this box. And the only one that then fits my mm-hmm. schedule is German literature. How much, how often do you think I talk about German literature with anybody? I mean, no, nobody. <laughs> but the trades, you're going to own a house someday. You're, you know, you're going to have family who needs help with something. You got into plumbing for two years and you learned all these skills, you can still go help them. So anybody who's even thinking about it should try it. And the worst thing I, I school counselors and some parents still that say, go find yourself a college or go for the experience. That's, I, don't, I can't say the words I want to say, because you know, but that, it's that. And... Uh, you don't, you don't find yourself putting yourself in 30000 in debt. Mm-hmm. You can find yourself getting around the right people and um, just figuring out who you are. And sometimes that takes some hard work. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things, our class specifically first year is on a Wednesday because it's almost like a recess. Mm-hmm. A lot of our students first time are from high school. So they're used to that, you know, school day schedule. They're not used to working 45, 50 hours a week. So by having class on Wednesday... Like I said, it's almost like a recess where they get to have a little break in their week as they're working their way into the working world. Mm -hmm. Because working 40 to 50 hours, I mean, school may suck right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) you may think it's horrible, but working 50 hours a week, that's uh, that's worse. If if you can think, there's something worse than school, working the rest of your life. Now, when you enjoy what you do, it still works. I I don't buy that line either, that if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life. It it still works. Okay. (laughs) How did you come in contact with Mr. Jarrett? LinkedIn. Uh, I saw a post either he was, he liked something and we had a mutual connection and mm-hmm. it's, I was just like, man, this is awesome. And we connected, but what we're doing here is what this generation needs to do more of. Took the effort to like, you know what? I'm not just going to be a online connection through a phone or a computer. I want to meet. I want to see it in hands-on. I want to be part of the dope podcast. I mean, I'm sure this technology, we could have done this via, you know, Zoom or something, and you could have edited it in, and it would have worked on your editing skills. But I want to make a real connection here. And so it was LinkedIn. Um, saw the things. I see his posts. I like most of them. On the ones I don't, it's just because I miss them. <laughs> but what you guys are doing here is so amazing. And... Um, to, to steal the word you guys use a lot, dope recognizes dope. You know, I mean, you guys are doing something that I don't see because I'm, I'm looking at the pages on across the Insta and X now and all the different platforms. Nobody else is doing this across the country. And so when I saw this, I want to I wanna be a part of it. I want to be on the dope podcast. I want to just soak this environment in. I want to spend a day of my vacation um, here with back in, in middle school. And that, so that's how we connected. But yeah, when you saw us shake hands in the hallway, that was the first time we physically contacted. We're not <laughs> Do you think programs like yours will benefit exposing youth at a early age to the trades? Oh, goodness, yes. That's, that's something education and the trades are both uh, guilty of. We do not promote what we do enough, and we do not expose children to it enough. Um, that's said earlier last spring i got a chance i talked through kindergarten through second graders and it was a initiative waterloo iowa is where i'm from uh, there's 13 elementary schools and so one of the charities in town was like there it was called the touch a truck event so plumbers firemen garbage guy they all can all these trades these blue collar jobs to expose them to and a couple years ago somebody told me or they talked you know why do 
when the army comes to school fairs, why does the army come to an elementary school fair? They just want and have push-up contests. You know, as you get older, push-ups aren't cool, but in elementary school, yeah, how many push-ups can you do? I'll give you a t-shirt. They're just putting it in their mind that this is something cool. Well, we as the trades and as education need to do a better job of that. Since about, the research I've done says since about 1980, we've been pushing this lie that to be successful in life, you have to go to college. And that is a complete lie. Uh, there are tons of great careers that you can support your family, support yourself, that don't involve a college degree. And so we have to get that mindset changed. And that's with counselors, that's with teachers, that's with parents. And so it's just slowly, it's things like this that, you know, more people are going to see this and be like, oh, maybe I am putting too much pressure on my junior, my senior. Like, where are you going to go to college? No. What are you going to do to make yourself happy? And um, this is where, you know, money doesn't buy you happiness. You know, I'll, I'll throw that out there. You got to, what's inside you, you got to find that. And it, it's going to change over life. You're going to be, ha- something's going to make you happy at 20 that's different than 40. <laughs> okay, let's stop. I got at 16, I got to get you up to 16 before I get you to 20, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but with that said, with a big old asterisk, if you have money, you can pursue those things that make you happy. And so, so the money isn't going to make you happy, but if you have some disposable income, you have a great job, you have a career that gives you vacation days. I mean, vacation days are one of the greatest things ever. I did three weeks a year that I get paid not to work, you know? So that's a benefit that then I get to do what I want to do with my passion. And like I said, I'm here today because getting young people into the trades, back to your original question, I know I sometimes jabber, <laughs> um, but getting young people into trades, that's my passion. That's what gets me going. So yes, I'll take a day of vacation to talk to the A team, the dream team. I've been told this is the dream team. So if you're watching, this is going to be one of the last episodes with the dream team. And they got, they got Lauren, LG. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Your emphasis on exposure to real world experience is evident. How can the industry improve in providing these experiences to students? And what role do you think this education program should play in facilitating this? Okay. Yeah. So even just in the talks, Mr. Jared and I have had, like, you're, you do it here. But now you got to remember this for four years. And so that, that's a travesty. And I'm, that, but you at least have it at some point. So I'm not knocking, you know, I don't want hate mail from the Philadelphia School District. Um, but, but you're doing something, you're at least doing something. There are so many across the country. Like I said, this is, this is a unicorn here, the program, that you guys are getting to do all this stuff. But you have to keep that passion. If there's some little fire inside you, you got to keep it going. And hopefully you'll have a teacher at the high school level that just keeps asking the right questions. Uh, So the education 100% has a duty to start exposing students to this stuff. And we are failing. Um, The great thing about the trades right now, salaries are going through the roof. Why? Because it's supply and demand. Um, I can't speak out here in Philadelphia or the East Coast, but in Iowa, you know, in the next, I always tell people who are getting into it, in your lifetime, you're going to be making $100,000 a year. And that's in Iowa, where our cost of living is a third of what your guys' is out here. I mean, between utilities and rent and all that stuff. I mean, that's crazy money. Um, and so we need to stop saying, hey, go get that English non-teaching degree or go get your gen ed at a, even when they say go to a community college to just get your gen eds knocked out of the way so when you figure out what you want to do, no, why don't you go try the trades? Go go build some houses. Feel good about it. The pride you have if you drive past something and you're like, when I'm driving with my techs, you know, and they're like, yeah, I did that building. I mean, one of our guys, every place he goes, a restaurant, you know, his wife's always at Christmas parties and stuff saying how he's always bragging, like, oh, yeah, I hung that duct. (laughs) But that's the pride, and you get that from working with your hands. So, what the education system needs to be held more accountable back to your original question. Um, we need this program. We need this program starting in elementary school, exposing the middle school needs to be getting a little bit more hands on. And then as you get to high school, you need to be able to go full in all knowing to explore if the trades are the right thing for you to do. You mentioned the satisfaction of seeing level one class projects come together. Could you share any other memorable experiences or lessons learned from interacting with students that have left a lasting impression on you? Yeah. The the one you're referring to is every year our level ones, they build what we call Frankenstein. 
And so it's a, it's what's ever in my head the day we actually start building. I, so to my bosses who think I plan that ahead of time, I'm sorry. It, nope, it comes to me the day of class. Um, we'll find out if they watch now, if my, <laughs> this podcast. Um, so, but this Frankenstein, it's usually, it's on wheels. It has to be mobile, but it, sometimes it's a shower. Sometimes it's a bathroom group. Sometimes, um, but then as they're doing it, I'll mix things up. I'll put a duct, piece of ductwork right where they were going to put pipes so they have to mess around. But they have to build the whole framing. They have to do this. And then sometimes I let the, yeah, the level threes and the level fours come in and kind of mess some things up, pretend they're the drywallers and put a hole through their <laughs> water line, things like that. So when they actually turn the water on, that's the specific example I think I, I mentioned uh, when they turn that water on, when they flush that toilet for the first time, you just see pride in all of their faces. That gets me every time. Um, another memorable experience. You guys do safety out here too. Mm -hmm. um, this year's safety class, we get up on the roof of our building. And so we're up there and hey, we got three rungs above. We got it bungee corded off. We're safe. We're doing some, some maintenance up on the roof. Getting up and get down. We're carrying buckets and things just to be safe. Carrying it with rope. One of the apprentices looks off over into the, like, man, is that rain? Uh, me being kind of the older school version of, yeah, suck it up. Let's, uh, <laughs> it's not going to rain. And then a couple drops and somebody asks, what do you think? Can we get off the roof and get over it? We're working. And then it just opens up <laughs> into a torrential downpour. Now I have to get nine students. Now they're from, I actually have a couple high schoolers. So they're from 16 to 38. I have to get them off a pouring down roof. <laughs> but you know what? It was safety day. So this was a great, they'll never forget this. And we all get down and the last person is like, oh, do you want me to get the, uh, I'll get the bungee off the rope. And I mean, the wind's just howling. I was like, no, no, no. This is pure safety right now. If this was a, it, well, not if, it was a real storm, you're going to leave that ladder there. You, whatever is damaged by that ladder is not more important than your life because you still have to climb down now without it secured. Um, but they had it well secured and we're out there, we're standing inside the door um, with the window and we're watching this ladder like swing, but it's held up by that bungee and they're all just getting this, all right, hey, we actually, we achieved the, uh, the, um, the outcome we were looking for that we had a safe ladder that we climbed up and then it stopped raining and we got back up on the roof. <laughs> but uh, there's a picture of us where we're just all soaked. I mean, so that's <laughs> best, best safety day I've ever had. The fun fact about driving to work on a lavender moped is intriguing. Can you share more about this choice and its significance to you? Oh, well, um, boy, the significance. You make it sound like I put a lot of thought into it. No, it's, uh, I'm, I'm cheap. That's one thing. And mopeds don't take a lot of gas. But uh, I don't know when you're editing this. Or is this live? Or is this, this will get edited? Edited. Okay. <laughs> so there is, I can show you a video. There is a video on our website of me driving and they put a cape on me. I'm like driving around on the <laughs> moped. Um, but uh, the significance, yeah, I, it's fun. And I like to have fun. So w whether guys are coming, texts are coming in on the morning and they're having a bad morning, you are children. So you probably upset your parents once in a while in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being honest. Um, so mine do the same. I've got a sophomore, an eighth grader, and a fourth grader. So there's some mornings I'm leaving the house, not exactly big smiles. Um, but when my, when my people see me coming in on this little, zzz, and I mean, it, I mean, it'll get up to 40 if I have a long straightaway and, um, and it was lavender. I had every intention of painting it a cooler color, but now they call it the purple dragon when they see me coming in. And when guys see me, they're honking at me and they're smiles. So no matter how bad a day they were having, it just puts them in the right mood. But it, it also, it's, you know, just humble yourself. I don't need something big and fancy. I just, I'm cool riding around on a moped yeah. with a helmet, of course, safety, safety <laughs> second. All right. Last question. Your schedule in the trades allows for a good work life balance. How do you think this aspect of the profession contributes contributes to overall job satisfaction and what advice do you have for the individual seeking a career that offers such benefits all right yeah no does anybody have a job yet i guess in eighth grade probably not no no, no. so you're probably your first jobs are gonna be nights and weekends because mm -hmm. that's when you can you're not at school mm -hmm. and and that sucks sorry am i not supposed to say that it's okay okay no, it's okay. Good. okay um but yes as you get the trades for the most part are an eight to five job and I love that. 
And, I, and then as you get to a larger company, like our company does offer overtime services, but we've got a 13 week rotation. So that means four times a year, these techs are on, they have to do overtime, which are um, on call services. So that means emergencies where furnaces or water leaks in the middle of the night or weekends. Four times a year, that's not that bad. It is amazing though, the number of times that that week lines up with their vacation and they have to <laughs> then try to reschedule. But that work-life balance, what you said, there's my key to happiness. I mean, I love my family. We, we drove from Iowa because I just, I like the time in the car with my family. Um, I love that I get to coach um, baseball and softball until they get to high school for my kids. Um, I love that I, I make almost every game and concert and parent teacher conference. And if there's parent lunches or something that something fun to do, I have the flexibility to get to those things. And as as you get older, time becomes even more of an asset than money. Um, but again, I'm afforded to say that because I have a job that pays me good money. Mm -hmm. And so I really value the time that it gives me uh, because family, family's here. I, as much as passion as I have about the trades, my wife, my kids, then my extended family, um, so, yeah, mom, dad, yes, of course, you know, <laughs> my brother, my sister, okay, but... Um, no, my, my immediate family, that's, that's my world. And so yes. having the time to do that um, and then still get to do something I love, it's great. And because nights and weekends is when fun happens and I don't want to be working it. So there's another reason. You get paid good, you work um, decent hours. Your first couple of years, you do a lot of hard work. And I, and I shouldn't say that. Your, your whole career, you're going to do hard work. But anything worth doing is worth putting the effort into. And it, the more reward you get from it. Thank you so much, Mr. Taylor, for coming out and letting us interview you in the Dosing Podcast. Before we end off, do you have any social media page where anyone can reach you out on? Yes, um, all of them. Um, ooh, can, I, can I test your guys' editing skills? They're here, 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 and here. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, um, yes, but for both Blackhawk School, um, I think on one of them I had to use a one instead of an L, um, but Blackhawk School of Apprenticeship, um, also, Bergen Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling is the uh, actual company in Waterloo, Iowa. Um, yeah. And that's it? Yeah. And I'm always, I'm hashtag apprenticeship works. I, everything, I just, it's the truth. Apprenticeship works. Okay. Thank you. Oh, add one thing. Oh. Do you have like a graphic design program or something here at the school? No. no. Aren't we no, doing like a t-shirt? Well, that's what I said. Do you guys have a logo? Yeah, Yes, we're having yearbooks. We're having our logos. Because yeah. yeah. a sticker swap, all the trades people that follow you, Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's already there. All right. So mm -hmm. we'll have to do some sticker swap then. Okay. Yep. All right. So, nope, that's all I got. Okay. Thank you so much for watching another episode of the Dope Student Podcast. Bye. Bye. <laughs>